Hello, Dr. Stevenson. Uh, thanks for joining us today to uh, most of my Hunter Hills Church friends who will watch this uh, later. This is Greg Stevenson. He um, is a professor at Rochester University, uh, formerly Rochester College, where I did my master's work. Uh, professor of New Testament. I've taken, I believe, courses on the Gospels, the early church and the Gentile mission with you, 2 Corinthians, and one of my favorites was Revelation. Um, and of course, during the midst of uh, the coronavirus and killer beasts from, or hornets or whatever coming around and all these things, people get excited about Revelation and end times, apocalypse, all that kind of language. And so I thought it would be good to have, if uh, you join us with some of your experience in Revelation, I think you just told me you did your um, dissertation for your PhD in Revelation. You've obviously written a great book on it that I have recommended to my church called A Slaughtered Lamb. So excited to, uh, to learn from you today. Well, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for asking me. Yeah. Well, we'll dive right in with a few uh, questions. First is just kind of for, for anyone who may know the book of Revelation, but not know a lot of the history. Can you bring us briefly up to speed on roughly when it was written? Who do we think wrote it? Why, why and to whom did he write it? Okay, uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, the book of Revelation <clears throat> is an example of apocalyptic literature, um, which was a type of literature that was very common for about a 400 year period from about 200 before the 200 years before the birth of Christ to about 200 years uh, after the birth of Christ. So one thing that's important for people to keep in mind, because a lot of people have this idea that the book of Revelation is somehow unique, uh, when actually it was a fairly well-established and well-known uh, literary genre you know, that had certain sort of standards and, and ways of communicating. And in particular, the book of Revelation, uh, the date of the, Re of the book of Revelation is somewhat debated, um, but pretty safely put usually somewhere in the second half of the first century. Yeah. Uh, so somewhere between, you know, the mid, you know, usually the mid 60s up until the mid 90s um, is usually somewhere in the area where it's dated. Uh, we know that the book of Revelation was written by John. Uh, the argument or, or the the controversy there is which John. Uh, you know, some people think of as John the Apostle, other people don't. Uh, most people think of it was someone named John. However, whether it was John the Apostle or some other early Christian um, <clears throat> figure of significance named John. Um, most important, though, I think, <clears throat> is more kind of where and why it was written. Right. Uh, the book is addressed to seven churches in Western Asia Minor, which today is uh, the Western area of Turkey. And that's important to keep in mind because, again, a lot of people have this kind of assumption of the book of Revelation as this sort of esoteric prophecy that's kind of divorced from time and place. And so it's important for us to keep reminding ourselves that this book was written to real churches and very real Christians at a particular point in time in history and was written to help them deal with the problems that they were experiencing uh, in that context. Uh, just like you know, when Paul writes a letter to the church at Corinth, he's writing it to help those Christians in Corinth deal with the issues they're facing. Uh, and the same thing's happening with Revelation. He's trying to address and speak to these Christians about the experiences that they're having uh, in their context and in their time. Yeah, so given that context, uh, you said the latter half of the first century, uh, what do we know about uh, Rome and first century Christians and what is that context in which they're living in? Okay, yeah, there seems to be, you know, again, uh, the common sort of traditional understanding of the book of Revelation is that it was written primarily to address Roman persecution of Christians. Um, and there definitely seems to be some of that. Uh, there certainly is some language in Revelation that talks about persecution and Christians having been killed. Um, but particularly scholars now have backed off of that a good bit. Um, and realize that the actual issues being faced by these churches is much more complex than that. And, if, you know, if you look at the seven letters that are written to these seven churches, you see a lot of diversity in terms of the kinds of issues and things that they're dealing with. And essentially the way I kind of lay it out is there are really kind of two <clears throat> very broad problems that are being addressed here. And they both have to do with Roman society. Uh, again, you know, the Roman empire was the dominant force in the world at this time. It controlled the world at least the world as, as these people knew it. Uh, it controlled the economic system, the social system, the military system. And so that was the power under which these people lived and that power you know, shaped all of society around them. 
And so a lot of the issues that the people in, in these churches are dealing with have to do with how they relate to the society in which they live. And kind of what I argue, and I argue this in the book, um, is that you have sort of two things going on. One of which is you do have some Christians that are staying faithful. Uh, or maybe a good way to set this up is, you know, if you read the, the book of Revelation, one of the things you quickly pick up on is John uses a metaphor of warfare. You know, mm -hmm. He sets it up as though there's a war going on. And the war, as he describes it, is a war between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world. Mm -hmm. So you have these two different kingdoms, you know, the kingdom of the world that in their context is primarily, you know, embodied in Roman society, and then the kingdom of God. And these two in, in the book of Revelation are set up in conflict. Well, part of it is for those Christians that are staying faithful to God, uh, they're finding them, themselves coming into conflict with Roman society. Uh, and that leads to various forms of suffering. It leads to some forms of persecution uh, that they're having to deal with. The flip side of that, though, <clears throat> is you also have other Christians. And again, this is the evidence for this is borne out in the seven letters as well, who are choosing a different approach, uh, that their approach to Roman culture is to compromise with it. Uh, to accommodate with it, that they think that they can maintain faithfulness to God by living more like the people around them uh, and, you know, buying into certain Roman values and Roman ways of doing things. And from John's perspective in Revelation, these people have sold out. You know, they've sold out their allegiance to God uh, by giving their allegiance to the Roman Empire, to the, you know, society. Because again, you know, if you're in a situation where faithfulness to God leads to suffering, well, one way to avoid that suffering is to accommodate to Roman society. Um, and, and to, you know, compromise with some of those values. And so John's actually writing to kind of do a couple of different things. One, to those Christians who are staying faithful and suffering as a result, he's wanting to comfort them, uh, to encourage them to continue uh, to stand in faithfulness to God. But to that other group that from John's perspective, and in the, you know, the letters to the seven churches, John talks about several false teachers in the church that are, that are promoting these kinds of ideas that you can live a certain way uh, in Roman society and begin get along just fine. And, and John looks at that and calls it idolatry. Uh, to that group, you know, he gives them a warning. Uh, he presents in the book of Revelation a challenge to them that they need to give up this allegiance that they formed with the world around them and devote themselves solely to God. And so to that group, the book form uh, functions essentially as a call to repent. So yeah. it really has those kind of two, two prongs there. It's, it's trying to comfort and uh, challenge and call to repent at the same time. Yeah. So that warfare is between uh, the kingdom of God and Satan evil. And kind of what John seems to be saying is that Rome is just kind of the puppet of evil right now. And at one point in history, it was Babylon. At one point, it's been Egypt. That empires are always kind of a, a puppet of evil, right? And we have the choice as Christians to compromise and live within the empire or to live against it and the suffering that comes with, right? Yes, exactly. I mean, one of the things about <clears throat> apocalyptic literature, like the book of Revelation, is it tends to communicate through symbolism and the use of symbols. Uh, and this is what confuses a lot of people when they read Revelation, is what to, to make of these symbols. But a lot of the symbolism in the book is, as you just mentioned, draw, drawn from Old Testament uh, prophecy, from Israelite history. And so John uses a lot of symbols in this book that connect to previous empires like Egypt, uh, Babylon, as you mentioned. Um, even the Seleucid Empire, which you know, was responsible for the persecution of the Jewish people uh, mm -hmm. during the Maccabean Revolt. And so he, you know, he, a lot of the symbolism that he uses to talk about Rome, he deliberately tries to connect it to these previous empires, uh, whether it's Egypt, Babylon, or the Seleucids, that at various times in history had persecuted God's people. Mm -hmm. And so it's a way of saying that what you're experiencing right now under the Roman Empire is not something new that it's simply one manifestation of this war between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world that's been going on you know, for millennia. Uh, and God's people have always suffered as a part of this, this war that's going on when they tried to stand faithful for the kingdom of God. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I want to ask two follow-up questions, but before that one, we, we've used the word apocalypse a couple of times, and I'm no uh, Greek scholar, but it, that simply is just the Greek word, right, that we've translated to Revelation. Uh, but we hear the word apocalypse, apocalyptic. We think of the movies, th things like that that use that language. What does that word actually mean, especially for John and his readers? Yeah, uh, that's a great point. Um, yes, I mean, uh, that's another thing that tends to confuse people because it is a term that has come to mean something very different in our culture today from what the term actually meant 
originally. Uh, and today, yes, when people hear the word apocalypse, they immediately think of destruction or end of the world, uh, these sort of doomsday scenarios. And that's not at all what the term meant uh, or any connotation that it had uh, back then. Now, the term does actually come from Revelation. Uh, that's where the term uh, sort of originates from, or at least where, you know, in the way that we use it today, it comes from. And it's because in, in you know, the modern mindset, we've associated the book of Revelation with the end of the world and destruction. Right. And that's how the term came to uh, acquire that meaning throughout history. But yeah, originally the, the Greek word apocalypsis um, <clears throat> really just means a revealing or an unveiling. Mm. Uh, so it's about, you know, pulling back the curtain to reveal something, to expose something. And part of what's interesting in, in the book of Revelation, and, and the term's only used one time in Revelation, it's right at the very beginning. Uh, where the book begins with the phrase apocalypsis Jesu Christu, which means the apocalypse of Jesus Christ or the revealing of Jesus Christ. And that's a pretty important statement, I think, because you know, when John says what the, you know, John tells us what he thinks this book is about. And John does not say that this book is about the end of the world. He says, this is a book that's about Jesus Christ. Right. You know, he tells us that from the beginning, this is the revealing of Jesus Christ or the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And later in chapter 19, <clears throat> verse 10, you know, John says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, uh, which is a very important statement because it tells us what John thinks about prophecy. You know, we, we hear the word prophecy and we think prediction of the future. And so mm -hmm. that's what Revelation is all about if it's prophecy. Uh, John tells us that the, what he means when he uses the term prophecy is prophecy is the witness of Christ. It's the witness of Jesus and witnessing to Jesus. That is what prophecy for John is all about. Uh, so, yeah, this idea of, of the book being an apocalypse uh, or a revelation, it's not that John is so much revealing, you know, what's going to happen in the future, or what's going to happen in the world around us today. What he's trying to do primarily in this book is reveal something about Jesus and the central role that Jesus plays in the plan of God. Yeah. So with that, you know, one of the questions that I know people watching this are going to want to know from a, from a guy who's done his PhD work in Revelation uh, at Emory, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so is this t telling us about the end of the world and killer hornets and is Carol Baskin the Antichrist or what, what, uh, what do we make of this? You've mentioned that a lot of the symbolism was from the world in which they lived and they were more familiar with that stuff than we were. Um, it seems like today a lot of us have read Revelation like it was written to us for this time we're living in, that we're watching the events unfold. Where do you fall on that spectrum, um, ultimately leading to a question that we can answer here in a moment of what good is it to us today, I guess? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, I can't rule out Carol Baskin being involved, but um, <laughs> yeah, essentially... <clears throat> You know, again, there is this, this perception that Revelation is essentially a book that's kind of like, you know, an ancient Nostradamus, just sort of giving us predictions of what's going to happen in the world around us, uh, leading to the end of the world. A couple of things to keep in mind. One is that the book of Revelation actually talks very little about the end of the world. Um, now, there's a lot of language about judgment, but there's very, very little about the actual end of things. Mm. Now, it is there. It is part of what John is talking about. Uh, but we tend to give that, I think, too much emphasis uh, and think of the book too much in that respect so that it causes us to miss so much more of what John is trying to do uh, and communicate through this book. Um, essentially, kind of where I come, I mean, there are a lot of different <clears throat> approaches and ways of reading Revelation that we've, we've seen throughout history. Um, and one of the things, of course, is to try and take the book and connect it up with uh, historical events or what's going on in the world or see it as signs of the end. Um, I've done a kind of a detailed study of this. And one of the things you notice if you go back 2,000 years is what you'll see for the last 2,000 years, Christians have been doing this regularly. <laughs> going all the way back to the first century, Christians were looking at, you know, signs in the sky and comets and earthquakes and natural disasters and wars and identifying them, uh, connecting them up with the book of Revelation and saying, you know, this is the end right now. We're living in the end times. Uh, they've been doing that constantly for the last 2,000 years. You know, predicting the end, identifying different features. And of course, it all panned out to be wrong. Mm. Um, that kind of tells me on one hand, that's not the most helpful way of, of reading or approaching this book. Again, I tend to approach this book. And if you look at, you know, if you, again, I, this is why I set up talking about how this is an example of apocalyptic literature. Right. So if we go back and we look at other examples of apocalyptic literature from the ancient world that communicate in the similar way, use similar kinds of imagery, uh, and how they function, it helps us understand 
uh, the book of Revelation more. And essentially, you know, the book of Revelation, you know, John calls it prophecy. But again, we have to not get tripped up there because when John says this is a work of prophecy, what he means is I am writing just like the Old Testament prophets wrote. So he sees his book as being like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Hosea. And if you go back and look at the Old Testament prophets, what you see is that they were writing to address the needs of Israel at that point in history. You know, they're trying to help Israel or Judah or, or these nations deal with, uh, you know, they were calling them to repentance and trying to comfort them and, you know, and, and, and so forth. Um, but they would use symbolic and poetic language uh, as a way of talking about what God was going to be doing in their midst. And Revelation's doing a similar thing. I mean, it's being written to seven churches to help them deal with their problems. And so all of the symbolism and the imagery and the things in this letter are really designed to help these churches in the first century. And if John were writing about things you know, that were happening in the newspapers and, you know, 2020, right. that would have had absolutely no relevance to these people. They wouldn't have understood it. It would have been meaningless to them and completely pointless. Um, rather, what's going on here is, yes, there is some language about the future in this book, uh, but it's there to speak to John's churches in the present. You know, John is not trying to give us a blueprint about what's going to happen at the end of the days or what's going to happen in, in the future so we can you know, match it up with the newspaper or you know, cable news right. network. Uh, what he's saying to his audience back in the first century is God has a plan. You know, God has a plan for his creation. And you know, this is a book about revealing. So what John does is kind of reveal a little bit about what God's ultimate sort of end game is. Right. But he does that in order to help his audience in the present. Um, you know, kind of the example I use sometimes is it's like if you go to the doctor and you get a terminal diagnosis, you know, you have six months left to live, well, suddenly all of your priorities shift. Mm -hmm. you know, because you've given, been given this brief glimpse into the future that you know, okay, I only have this much time left and here's how it's going to end, that causes you to reevaluate everything in the present uh, and all the choices that you make now. So things that maybe were so important to you five minutes ago are no longer important. Or things maybe that you've kind of pushed off and said, I'll worry about later, you know, suddenly become something you need to address right now. And that's what that's why you have some of this future language in Revelation is John is trying to say to his readers, you know, here's the plan that God has. Here's where everything is heading. Because of this, you need to make some choices right now. You, know, right. you need to decide right now how you're engaging the world around you, you know, how you're standing in faithfulness or not standing in faithfulness. Yeah, so it's kind of like it appears that that Rome is in control and is is the one in which we put our allegiance. But John's saying, I'm going to reveal to you where this ultimately goes who Rome actually is, therefore, make your choice in light of that. Yeah, it comes back to that war metaphor again, where you, you, you have a war going on, you know, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world. And one of the things Revelation is trying to say to its audience is you need to choose which side you're going to be on. You know, which side are you aligning yourself with? Because, you know, here's how things are going to end up. And so, you know, the decisions you make right now are going to have ultimate consequences. Yeah, that's great. So I want to come to the war metaphor and ask a question about, about that in just a moment. One quick question, though. Can you tell us, when we think of Revelation, we think of Antichrist, 666, some of those big things. Can you pick just one or two of those and say, in the context where that comes from, what the symbolism actually is and means? Yeah, the, the Antichrist one is an interesting one. Um, because a lot of people associate the, the Antichrist with the book of Revelation, and yet the word Antichrist is never used anywhere in the book of Revelation. Uh, that word does not come right. from Revelation. It's never mentioned. There is no Antichrist, uh, at least by name, in the book of Revelation. Uh, the term is only found really well within one author. It's really only found in two places in the Bible, and that's in Second John and or First John and Second John. Mm -hmm. uh, the only places that the Antichrist term is used. And if you look at the context of those letters, <clears throat> John there means something very specific by the term Antichrist, which has nothing to do with Revelation. Right. Um, why that term has gotten associated with Revelation is because you do have in uh, 1 John this, this reference to this idea that, and, you know, John talks about many antichrists are already here among you, but then he does make this brief reference of you've heard that an antichrist is coming. So people take the term from second or 1 John, and then they'll go to like uh, 2 Thessalonians where Paul talks about a man of lawlessness that's going to come, some kind of political figure, and they connect those two together. <laughs> And then in Revelation, you have this character known as the beast, right? Uh, which is described again in, in symbolism that's sort of the opposite of the lamb in Revelation. So he is kind of seen as being a polar opposite to the lamb who is Christ. 
And so they take the man of lawlessness, they take the beast of revelation, they take the term antichrist from second John and combine it all together. Um, <clears throat> a couple of things we got to keep in mind there is we don't know for sure that they are supposed to be combined together, uh, that it's possible that John and Paul and revelation are talking about three different things. Um, but there also may be some overlap there as well. Uh, but that term in revelation is mainly associated with the beast. Um, and the beast in the book of Revelation is an animal symbol <clears throat> that would have been very common to John's audience. These were the kinds of um, <clears throat> creatures and things that they had in their stories and in their mythology. And it was typically, th these kinds of creatures were typically used to represent kingdoms or empires. And so the beast in Revelation is, uh, there are actually two beasts in Revelation, but they're basically a representation of the Roman Empire and the Roman power that John's audience is, uh, is dealing with. And so, um, you know, kind of the answer there is, um, on one level, there is no antichrist in Revelation, but there is a figure that, that functions that way. Um, but again, John describes the beast in Revelation, which again, the first beast in Revelation is usually taken to be a representation of the Roman emperor as the, the you know, figurehead of the power of Rome. But John describes this beast in ways, again, that connects it to previous rulers of empire, the ruler of Babylon, the, you know, the pharaoh of Egypt and so forth. Uh, so that it's kind of this symbol <clears throat> that represents, again, you know, the, these empires that repeatedly throughout history uh, torment and, and oppose God's people. Yeah, so we probably shouldn't spend a lot of time looking for an antichrist and the mark of the beast in our modern times. I, I think so, in, at least in terms of some kind of specific identification. You know, we're, you know, you know, right. I kind of been, find it almost humorous that you know, if you look at politics, you know, every election, no, no matter who the new president is of whichever political party, the opposite party identifies that person as the antichrist. <laughs> uh, these things keep happening. Right. Yeah, I don't, I don't think uh, there's much fruit to be born out of that. Again, if you look over the last 2,000 years, you've, been, you've seen people have been identifying antichrists. You know, every generation has been identifying multiple antichrists throughout history. Um, <clears throat> but in a general sense, um, you know, the idea of the beast or the antichrist, I think, is something that persists because, you know, John sets it up as these empires keep coming and going. And so the idea of... <clears throat> This kind of imperial force that stands in opposition to God's kingdom, I think, is something that sort of continues. So in that broad sense, there are things that function in that way. In fact, I remember when I was at Emory, um, <clears throat> I was serving as a teaching assistant for Luke, one of Luke Johnson's classes on the introduction to the Bible, and it was the day he was talking about Revelation. <clears throat> and I remember he said to the class, the beast is Lennox Mall which was this mall in Atlanta, which was kind of the rich and famous. You know, this is the mall where all the wealthy people went. Right. You know, everything was, was overpriced. And so he was saying, you know, consumerism is the beast. Ah. You know, materialism is, again, sort of one of these weapons that Satan uses to fight this war. And that, that's how the beast really functions in Revelation. Right. Uh, it simply functions because, you know, chapter 13 of Revelation tells us that the dragon or Satan gives the beast its power and its authority and uses it to wage this war on God's people. And so the beast is a symbol uh, really just represents the weapon that Satan is using to attack God's people. And in different times and different cultures, you know, that may manifest in different ways. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out, you said on page 24 in your introduction, um, to declare that all suffering is evil. And so part of the, your book here is a response to evil and suffering and kind of using Revelation um, as a text toward that end. But you say, uh, to declare that all suffering is evil is to deny the very pattern of Christ in which the choice of suffering provides not only redemption, but a pattern to be imitated by those who bear his name. So that language of the pattern of the Christ um, and the book is called a slaughtered lamb. And we've been using this language of warfare and kind of choosing your sides. Um, when we think of revelation, we might think of a rider on a white horse whose robes are dipped in blood. Sounds kind of violent. Was it Nietzsche who said it's an extremely violent, bloody, horrible text right um but then the language of a slaughtered lamb uh doesn't fit quite the warrior that we expect what what is the pattern of the christ um later on i know you say it in your book and i think michael gorman and others that john says he <clears throat> hears one like a lion right and when he turns he doesn't see a lion he sees a lamb that looks as though it's been slain so is the pattern of the christ the warrior on the white horse violently destroying enemies what does this look like how do we find our place in this warfare yeah this issue of suffering 
Um, and yeah, that is a big focus of the book. This is something I think is central to the book of Revelation and what John is talking about, although not always in the ways that we've often uh, kind of rendered it. Um, but yeah, you know, we, we, a lot of people, we tend to have this sort of perception of suffering as evil, uh, largely because we don't like it. It's unpleasant. It's painful. Um, but we often obscure the fact that if you look at the Bible, what you see is that suffering often serves a lot of valuable functions. <clears throat> you know, some people will, will often ask, you know, why, does, why didn't God just create a world with no suffering? Well, I think the fact that we have so much suffering in the world, you know, maybe suggests that God finds something valuable in that, that there is something redemptive in a creation of which suffering is a part. And in fact, what you see um, in the book of Revelation represented is that the way God chooses to deal with suffering you know, it wasn't to, you know, wave his hand and make suffering disappear. You know, God doesn't step in and alleviate, you know, the suffering of his people in Revelation. Uh, rather, what we see represented there is that the way God chose to deal with human suffering was to join us in it. Mm -hmm. The idea of the incarnation. This is something the author of Hebrews talks about uh, when he, he says in chapter two that the very reason Jesus was incarnated and became human was so that he could suffer. You know, yeah. so he could, you know only by being human could he suffer with us, could he die along with us. And by experiencing the suffering that we experience, <clears throat> only then could he become you know, a faithful uh, minister to us. And so this pattern of the Christ uh, that we see in Revelation, you know, it's, it's a threefold pattern that John lays out. And it's the pattern of faithfulness, suffering, and vindication. Mm. Uh, it's this idea that faithfulness to God inevitably leads to suffering, uh, is what John sets up. And you see that represented in Revelation in a number of ways, you know, that, that those Christians in Revelation who are being faithful are suffering. Uh, those who are not being faithful are not. In fact, one of the interesting things about the, uh, the letters to the seven churches is that, you know, you have in these letters a pretty standard formula where when Jesus addresses the churches, he will usually first praise them for the things they're doing well and then uh, attack them or indict them for the things that they're lacking in <clears throat> and need to repent of. Except there are two letters where John basically says nothing negative about the churches. Uh, yeah. It's all positive. And there are two letters where there's nothing positive said about the churches. It's just basically an indictment for their sin straight up. What I find fascinating about that, though, is the two churches about which Jesus has nothing to say negative are the two churches that are suffering the most. Mm. And the two churches that he has nothing good to say about are the two churches that are suffering the least. Uh, the ones that have compromised with Roman culture the most and are prospering and are wealthy and are, suffer, are not suffering. Mm. And so there is this clear connection in Revelation between suffering and faithfulness. Uh, so that in Revelation, if you're not suffering, that's when there's a cause for worry. Right. So, you know, Christ is the one who sets this pattern in Revelation. You know, he was the faithful witness of God, as he's called in chapter one. And because Jesus was faithful to God's calling, he suffered as a result and he was killed because of it. But the third part of that pattern is vindication, you know, the resurrection. You know, yes, Jesus was a faithful witness. He suffered and died because of it, and then God glorified him. And that's the pattern that <clears throat> uh, the Christians in Revelation are called to emulate. Uh, you know, we are called to also be faithful witnesses to Christ, knowing that if we do so, suffering will likely be a result. Uh, because if we're caught in this war you know, between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world, well, if you take a stand with the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the world is going to fight back. You know, and suffering uh, will be the result. But part of what John wants us to know is that if we follow that pattern of Christ, if we are faithful as he was, and even if we suffer as he did, even if it means to the point of death, we will also be vindicated as he uh, was vindicated. There will be that reward. And so we see in the seven letters how each letter ends with this promise to the one who overcomes, you know, to the one who stays faithful. Uh, you know, then there's these rewards out there. And you see that pattern particularly represented, I think, in the letter to uh, Smyrna, uh, where Jesus says to them in chapter 2, verse 10, you know, be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. You know, so you have faithfulness leading to suffering and death, but then leading to reward and vindication. Now, how that connects with the, uh, <clears throat> you know, the slaughtered lamb imagery, uh, as you mentioned, yeah, the slaughtered lamb is the dominant symbol used of Jesus in the book. Mm. There are a lot of very interesting uh, metaphors and images used of Jesus. You, know, you mentioned the rider on the white horse. Uh, and a number of others. Uh, but this is the one that tends to dominate. It's used 28 times uh, in the book of Revelation. And the first place it appears is in chapter 5. 
Uh, and that's the scene you're talking about where, uh, you know, an angel, John is having a conversation with an angel, or actually in this case, one of the 24 elders. And, you know, you have this scene where, you know, God is sitting on his throne and he's holding a scroll and they can't find anybody with the authority to open the scroll. And so they do a search of all creation, can't find anyone. And John is beginning to weep mm. uh, because the scroll won't be open. And that's when one of the 24 elders says to John, look, the lion of the lamb has come. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, when we think of the symbol of the lion, uh, you know, you tend to think of something that's powerful. You know, a lion's one of the most powerful animals. It's a symbol of royalty. And so, you know, John is told there's a lion come to save the day. Mm. And so he has this expectation that there's going to be this figure of great power, uh, this messianic figure who's going to come and resolve our problems, you know, with power. Because if you're fighting an enemy like the Roman Empire, you know, which is based in power, you need more power to defeat it. What's interesting, though, in, the, in this text, and this is something that happens several times in Revelation, is John has this rhetorical device where he uses seeing and hearing. And so what will happen first is somebody will hear something and then they'll turn to look at whatever it is that they heard and they'll actually look at it. And when they see it, they see something completely different from what they heard. And so it's like what they heard gets reinterpreted by what they see. And that's what's happening in this uh, passage where John hears that there's a lion coming. You know, the elder says to him, look, there's a lion over there. But then when John turns to actually look at the lion, we're told that what he actually sees is a slaughtered lamb. Mm. And so, you know, a slaughtered lamb is a very different symbol than a lion. You know, it, it's not a symbol of great power or military might uh, or messianic you know, royalty. It's a symbol of weakness. Um, you, know, you know, a lamb is one of the weakest animals and a slaughtered lamb you know, is even, even weaker than that. And so what happens is, you know, through this kind of what's called a transformation of symbols, <clears throat> you know, John has transformed the lion into a lamb. And it's not that the, the lamb is replacing the lion. It's saying that they're, they're one in the same. You know, the lion is the lamb, is the slaughtered lamb. And I think the message John's communicating through this, <clears throat> again, is the same message we just talked about, that you know, the way God chooses to deal with suffering is to join us in, you know, to join our suffering and to die. And John is saying that God's power <clears throat> is not manifest in the world the way the power of the Roman Empire is, you know, with, with might and force. Um, rather, God's power is manifested in weakness. Mm. The power of God, we see you know, most prominently in the cross, you know, and Jesus willing to be weak, willing to suffer and, and embracing that choice of suffering uh, is where God's power is manifest. And so I th that the symbol <clears throat> in Revelation is sort of saying to John's audience as well, that the way you fight the Roman Empire is not by taking up arms and going to battle. You know, the way you fight the Roman Empire is embracing the pattern of the Christ, you know, being willing to stand up as faithful witnesses, you know, to witness against the Roman Empire, to witness faithfully for the kingdom of God, even if that leads to, to suffering, and even if it leads to being slaughtered uh, as Christ was slaughtered. Yeah. So we're coming up on about two minutes left on the free Zoom call. I want to give you this. Uh, can you give us 30 seconds? You say Revelation is a deeply important book for modern readers today. Give us 30 seconds on why you think that is. And of course, everyone needs to buy the book to get the full detail. But what, why do you think it's an important text? Well, mainly because it's a book about allegiance. Uh, as we just said, it's a book about, you know, where is your allegiance? Is your allegiance to God, to the kingdom of God, or is your allegiance to the kingdom of the world? And so it's a book that, above all, is calling us to faithfulness. You know, it's trying to challenge us to be faithful in the society in which we live, especially when we live in a society that may be antagonistic to some of our faith and some of our beliefs. Uh, and ultimately, a second thing is that it's a book primarily about hope. You know, people tend to think it's a book about destruction, but it's really a book about creation. Um, you know, in the book of Revelation, yes, the world ends, but what comes right after that is a new heaven and a new earth. And yeah. so it's a book about how, you know, kind of like with resurrection, you know, the body dies to be reborn as a better body. Uh, the same thing happens with creation. And so this is a book really about how, you know, God is a creator. And so, yes, as one thing ends, something new and better comes out of it. And so primarily this is a book that's designed to give us hope in difficult and challenging times. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so the book is A Slaughtered Lamb. I'm going to link it on Facebook when I put this video up. Uh, I'd recommend everybody in my church buy it. You can get it via Amazon, um, or they could email you at Rochester probably and buy it somehow that way. Uh, lastly, unrelated to Revelation, you've done a lot of fun work on pop culture and theology with 
Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Glee. Um, if we go to your uh, link at Rochester University, you see things you're working on. It says you have a forthcoming work on theology in the Marvel Universe. Can you give us a quick advertisement on what we should look for with that? Well, it was forthcoming. It's actually out now. It came out in oh. December. Uh, yeah, it's Theology in the Marvel Universe. It's, based, it's, a, it's a book that I edited, so it's a, you know, scholars from all over the world have contributed essays to it. I wrote an essay in it as well as the introduction. So I've collected you know, these essays from various scholars. It's basically looking at uh, kind of the Marvel films, Marvel television, and Marvel comics, kind of taking all of those together, this, this larger universe that Marvel's created, and reading you know, several of these stories in light of uh, sort of theological ideas and themes. Yeah. And where can we, we find that work? Uh, uh, Amazon's probably the easiest and right. cheapest way to find it. Okay. Yeah. I will look there then. I'm excited to check that one out. Um, Dr. Stevenson, thank you so much. This has been a good reminder for me. I hope everybody realizes they just got a crash course in Revelation. And uh, I think it's an important text to pick up and read and read well in the world we're in today. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. Yeah. Look forward to seeing you again soon. You too.